Finnegan, your host of the Los Altos History Show. Our guest this evening is Irene Grenier. Welcome, Irene. Thank you for having me, Erin. Irene was born in Germany. She immigrated to the United States after having a choice to go either to Australia or the United States and wonders what her life would have been like if she had chosen Australia. Irene later followed her older brother to California and has lived here in California for several years. Irene is now a resident of Los Altos and lives with her family in one of the older homes here in town. From time to time on this show, we try to feature a historic property of Los Altos. Although Irene's home is not a designated property, it is of the 1908 vintage when the village of Los Altos was just beginning to grow. Remember that Paul Schaup, the town founder, purchased the present downtown Triangle and the present University Avenue and Orange Avenue residential areas from Sarah Winchester and her sister Isabel Merriman. Irene's home, located on Orange Avenue, is part of that original property that was sold in lots by the Altos Land Company. Irene, have you always been interested in, in history and historic homes, or how did you come to? I've always loved history and uh, old music, old books, old records, um, maybe because my family as immigrants only had what they could carry in their trunk with them. Um, as our heritage, you might say, I was always looking for the roots of anything, of wherever I was living. Um, so when we bought this older home, I knew someday I would want to look way back into its past. As a child, I always loved older books. I remember going into a bookstore and choosing some old volume and the shopkeeper would say, but here's a new copy. And I'd say, no, it's those yellowed pages that I would like. So it's a dream come true for me to have an older oh. home. Well, that's so interesting. You, you immigrated from Germany. Mm -hmm. and, and was it a, a huge shock for you to ultimately end up in California? Or? Well, a wonderful one. <laughs> um, my uh, father was headed for o Omaha, Nebraska, where our sponsor was, and he dropped off my mom and my brother and I in Boston. And he was heading to Detroit, or he headed through Detroit, where other Lithuanian immigrants told him, oh, you can get a job here without having to speak too much English for the Ford Motor Company. And so that's what happened. Uh, we settled in Detroit, and I remember Dad, who was an educator in Lithuania, huh. coming home in blue bib overalls and a blue work shirt and a black lunchbox in his hand every day. And then I remember the flurry of excitement when my mom was ironing a white shirt for my dad. He was finally getting <laughs> a the white American dream. Yes. <laughs> getting a white collar job as a draftsman. But uh, there was such an uproar in the house. West, so it's sort of the perfect mm -hmm. American story here. Right. And and you came to Los Altos, how did you end up in a historic home on Orange Avenue? Well, my husband, who was also from the Midwest, um, and I were living in Marin, and we thought that was going to be our forever home there. But he had a chance to start a business, and it required that we live in the peninsula until the business mm -hmm. uh, got going, and we discovered Los Altos. And Marin began to pale by comparison, <laughs> and we never went back. Uh, we loved it so much here. The, the way um, people are settled, in Los Altos, care for it, um, take uh, pride in their town was something nice to see. It is. It's, it's a wonderful small town right in the middle of everything. It's mm -hmm. charming. So now how did you come to buy your home there on Orange Avenue? 
Well, we were renting a small house on Orange Avenue, waiting for that business to take off. <laughs> and um, there was a big old home across the street, and I remember always looking at it and wishing <laughs> that I could have a home like that. But of course, our business was too new to yeah. go buy another home. So one day the house came up for sale, but the time wasn't right for us. But this was the days of those um, creative finances uh, deals, and, and they kept falling through. About three times the house would come up on the market and then go back off. And um, about a year and a half passed by, and we were in a position to buy um, Oh, that's buy wonderful. It, and the dream came true. Oh, that's wonderful. I know there's uh, nothing like an old home. You can copy the architecture. You can duplicate that, but you can't duplicate the feel of an old home. Oh, of all the and generations in it. Right. Now, um, once you got into the home, I understand you've done a lot of research on the families that, that live there. What triggered you to do that? Well, one day, <clears throat> there was an older couple standing at the front gate, kind of looking longingly at the house. And I asked the couple, can I help you? And the gentleman turned out to be Mr. Ed Woodworth and his wife. Mr. Woodworth had written a history of Los Altos, right. and he said, I grew up with the man who grew up in your house. I grew up two doors over. Oh, how and funny. the man who grew up in your house was um, Charles Denny, my playmate. So I kind of stored that away, that it was the Denny family that lived in our house, uh, he said, for some three generations. And um, he gave me, Mr. Woodworth gave me an envelope filled with things about the house. He said, I think you should have these things because they're about your home. And it were uh, town criers from the 1940s, which had an article about Orange Avenue and these first homes, of which ours was one. Um, Foothill focuses from the 1950s about the house and garden. Um, and then Mr. Woodworth gave me a copy of his book. He had written kind of a home-by-home -home description of the older homes right. in our area. <clears throat> so then, a little while later, um, our home was asked to be on a historical house tour, and I thought, now I'm going to do it. I've got to contact that Mr. Denny and see. Yeah, because that's what everybody wants to know, yes. I think, when they take a tour of a historic home. Is right. The history of the, the families. families. Yeah. So thanks to Mr. Woodworth, I was able to reach Mr. Denny, who was in his 80s, um, but had grown up in the house from mm, 1918 um, onward. His oh, wow. Three generations <clears throat> of his family lived there from 1918 to 1966. Were they the first family in the house? Not exactly the first. Um, the Dewars um, had the house before, and it was bought by Mr. and Mrs. Seiler from Missouri in 1918 for five thousand dollars. Now the Seilers were farmers from Missouri and they had their daughter Alma Denny and her husband James Denny move in with them from time to time and eventually they stayed on in the house through uh, 1966 when Mrs. Denny passed away. And they were the parents mm -hmm. of the Mr. Denny who you have That's now. That's right. Okay. Uh, James and Alma Denny had three children. Uh, Charles Denny uh, was the middle child. There was an older daughter, Mary, and then a younger brother, James. Uh, Mr. Denny, Mr. James Denny, had been a banker, a Federal Reserve um, Bank examiner. And then he had been with the Bank of Italy and Bank of, San Fran uh, Bank of America in San Francisco when he was out here in California. And um, Mrs. Denny, just like her mother before, was very active in the town, very active in the garden club with Mrs. Adams of uh, University Avenue. Oh, interesting. So they were really, all these generations, very mm -hmm. active in the community. Yes. So she was in the garden club and... Mm -hmm. I could tell. Um, she had the same love of flowers that Mrs. Adams, the first president of the Los Altos Garden Club, did. They would have some similar plantings as I had worked at uh, Mr. Adams' garden, too. And it was nice to see um, certain camellias or rhododendrons or calla lilies uh, mm -hmm. that were popular 
long before. And this was one of the things I tried to do with the house when we first moved in, was get the garden back to um, plantings of the 20s or 30s. Okay, now, yeah, what had happened to the house from the time that the Dennys lived in it until you purchased it? When Mrs. Denny passed away in 1966, the Woolley family bought it and lived there for the next 20 years. Jeez. So, um, in effect, we're only about the fourth family to live in this house, old house. And that, I think, is what has helped keep the house unchanged all this while. Uh, when Mrs. Denny passed away, um, things were really quite untouched. It was still a 1930s kitchen, and um, there hadn't been any major structural changes. In fact, when Mr. Denny sent me a plan of the house, I was really it's amazed. The same. Everything stayed the same. That's so Nothing interesting. Else. And since you've lived there, what have you done in the house? Have you changed anything? Well, um, after the earthquake and all the old lath and plaster came tumbling down, um, some rooms needed a little more repair than others, so we decided to take the kitchen and the den, which the Woolies had sort of modernized, and return them to an older look. The den was made to match the rest, the living room and dining room, duplicating the molding. And there we were very lucky because a lot of the uh, original building materials were left underneath the porch of the house. Oh, oh so, so you were able to pull them up and use right. them. Right. A lot of the wainscoting or uh, molding we were able to, um, to have in its um, original. Um, otherwise, in the kitchen, we made it a more 1930s look. And we would go to salvage yards to buy old window glass to use for oh. the kitchen cupboards because there's nothing like the old glass. Mm -mm. The ripples uh, are so much more delightful to look through. So you stance. actually purchased it from after having been taken out of other homes. You were able to go to the salvage yard. And, mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. So that um, the rest of the house still has its old windows intact. And as you look through them, uh, it's such a delight to see the, the waves that I thought this has to be repeated for something like the kitchen, too. Um, and then I would, I found myself getting involved in the arts and crafts um, movement study of it because it's a craftsman style house and I wanted to make sure anything we were doing to the house was architecturally correct so mm -hmm. I studied the um, um, colors of the day and um, wanted to make sure we got it all right. Well, that's such a wonderful thing for people to pay that sort of attention to the detail. Well, it was a delightful yeah. adventure for us to discover that. And we wouldn't have if we hadn't gotten started on this research of our home. Well, and, and that's what I thought I would ask you for our viewers and if anybody's interested in, in both duplicating some of the original furnishings and, and appearance of their homes as well as researching the history of the families, how would you recommend they go about it? Well. Talk to people and go right to the horse's mouth where you can. Um, talk to the previous owner and invariably they'll have another name to give you and then just keep going back. And if you want to know the right look, get a ladies home journal of the 1930s or the 1920s or I was buying the Craftsman magazine from 1910 and reading that for details. But we're very lucky here in Los Altos to have the History House, which is a wonderful repository for um, the history um, of the homes in town. You can get th this thread of um, life of, of the town because History House has been saving it for, it, for everyone to um, dip into and uh, it it's a great learn from. resource and, and there's been so many books published That's too right. on the history of town. And, and uh, there too you can find all that at History House um, and their archives are growing all the time as people come forward with um, memorabilia and photos to to share with History House and then it in turn can share it with the community so we're very lucky to have it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. We definitely are lucky to have History House here in Los Altos, and we're lucky to have people like you in the community to supplement those sorts of archival 
research tools and, and in doing all of your research I understand you found out some interesting detail about your families and, and the area itself. Well, when I contacted Mr. Denny finally, um, it, it has blossomed into a friendship that is still continuing. In fact, um, he and about 12 members of his family came to visit the house on a tour oh, and it was so wonderful hearing their reminiscences of how uh, it looked when grandma was living there, of how it was furnished. And I remember the surprise when Mr. Denny saw the bed which we had resurrected from the basement it was um, <laughs> fallen apart but we got it back together and when he saw it he said why there's my old bed <laughs> so oh, that's so neat things like that were very delightful and so we all enjoyed each other so much that we are still writing to each other I just uh, wrote to Mr. Denny and received a reply at Christmas time and other family members have written, stayed at our home. In fact, we stayed at Mr. Denny's home up in Reading. He was the mayor of uh, Reading, in fact. Oh, how interesting. And, um, and was he able to supply you with a lot of photographs of the family? Or yes, early? exactly. For the house tour then, he sent these beautiful old photographs, the pictures of his parents, um, uh, pictures of the house in the 20s, in the 50s, and then many reminiscences of growing up in Los Altos. He um, remembers the trains in Los Altos, since that has such a big part of uh, uh, a big role in Los Altos' history. He said there were um, two trains that left for San Francisco in the morning and two trains that came back in the evening one hour service, very on time, and only one stop in Atherton. And he said that the uh, townspeople would wait for that town, for that uh, five o'clock train to arrive. Especially the kids would hang out at the soda fountain waiting for that train, oh, and the townspeople would wait while the mail was being taken off that train and delivered to the post office in the general store there, Robinson's. Oh, so everyone was waiting for their mail. Right. And when that was over, then everyone went home to their suppers. But that was kind of like the um, center of the late afternoon's activities, is meeting and waiting oh, for the train. Fun. That's um, fun. And then uh, he remembers there being an empty field across the street, and that's what they used as their playground. Um, it, it's just been wonderful to picture him growing up in that house with yeah, his brothers. Really and personalizes sisters. it for yes. for you and, and the mm -hmm. community. I think. And his mother had kept a handwritten diary, which she put together for her children, of her family moving from Missouri and then the family's roots in Missouri, and. Um, um, the genealogy of the family and there oh, are wow. lots of photos in that. One of the nieces now in the family is at Berkeley and she's um, trying to have this bound into like a permanent um, archive nice. for all of the family family members to um, have a copy of and of course I'm going to ask her for one oh, you too. Must have one. <laughs> Sounds like they've been a wonderful contribution to a lot of Californian communities yes. then. And I thank you, Irene, again for being here and sharing this and for all of your research with the home and, and for all of our viewers. I hope you've enjoyed meeting Irene and, and you will definitely enjoy touring her home next. Please stay with us and we'll cut to that tape now. We're standing in front of the historic Grenier House on this gorgeous day. And with us again is Irene, owner of the home. Hello, Irene. Welcome, Erin. We couldn't have ordered up a nicer day, could we? <laughs> Definitely not. As we walk into the house, I can see that there are absolutely gorgeous gardens here in the front yard. And it looks like some of the plants are historic. Can you tell us a little about your garden? There are some plantings which we think are the original ones, certain uh, camellias and rhododendrons, uh, which I believe are the original to Mrs. Denny's uh, gardening tastes. But in planting more flowers, I decided to research um, which flowers would have been widely planted in the 20s and 30s, mostly the 20s then. And uh, here you can see the Lady Banks of Rose in full splendor. 
now in the spring. It has climbed up into the peach tree and there's the delightful fragrance of violets. Even at night, it's a beautiful sight to behold, like white pearls shining um, in the night. And uh, here in, along the fence, we have a border of peonies and tulips and iris, um, which would have been very popular in the uh, 20s and 30s. So each year they multiply themselves. Oh, and daylilies too are in this border so that there is a constant succession of bloom. Uh, the peonies will be starting, oh, it looks like in a couple of days, in fact, the buds are ready to open. So you'll have to come back again and catch the, <laughs> the show. <laughs> Here you can see some lilacs getting ready to bloom on the porch. And here. There were a lot of beautiful calla lilies here, and here are some mm. of the old rhododendrons and camellias that you see here. Holly was also very popular in the 20s, and there's a border of it there. Well, come on in, Erin. Well, thank you. Let me point out another rose here. Um, on the back of the porch is one of the old roses, Loren Vittoria. The old roses seem to be enjoying a real comeback now because their fragrance cannot be duplicated in the new roses at all. And uh, this is a rose uh, which was written up by one person as, if I could only have one rose in my garden, it would be La Reine Vittoria. And this is all full of buds now too. And the, the fragrance is just intoxicating. It has a cup-shaped bloom, which is very different from uh, the hybrid tea roses that you see nowadays. And like I say, that smell, there's just nothing like it. Is that original to the house though? Or is that no, but it would have been very popular in the 20s. Like I say, I got gardening books from the 20s and 30s and read what people were actually excited about back then. And it's, um, you can find those roses and uh, flowers by going to historical nurseries, which there are plenty of in our area. I understand that. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Irene, thank you for inviting us into your beautiful home. As we walked in, you got a sense of the wide open feeling and also really of the history of this home. Can you tell us a little about the original features in this room? Well, some of the hallmarks of the craftsman era um, were a love of wood, and so you'll find lots of uh, wood molding and paneling throughout the house. The um, railing leading up to the upstairs is a nice example of how they would mix woods. Uh, there is um, the light oak handrail and then the darker uh, cherry wood below. And this is what um, they like to do in the craftsman era is mix a lot of different woods together. And the lighting fixtures that you see here, most of them are the original except for the shades. I changed the shades, I have to confess. <laughs> but um, otherwise, um, those are all the originals that you see except for the dining room chandelier. In the living room, you'll see the uh, built-in bookcases. And uh, I can't tell you how often people have said, oh, my grandmother has a house just like this, and that's what they would be referring to, the bookcases on either side of the uh, fireplace. And then the dining room would have a built-in, as you see here, too. Um, uh, again, the simple, straight lines of the craftsman look. And lots of wood. And how about as far as the upholstery you chose for this room, does that fit with the arts and crafts, or more the 20s feel? Well, I always thought a house never stayed still either, so I didn't want the whole house to be a monument to the craftsman look. So just one room, the den, I'll take you there, um, is the craftsman look. But then the dining room is more of a 1920s, 30s look, going into 40s. This sort of has a William Morris um, design to it, 
um, as does the carpeting, and he was uh, a famous designer of the craftsman era. And then the colors. Um, there are certain colors that they used. Um, up here you see a little bit of like a puce green, which was popular, a certain kind of uh, grayed blue. Um, so it was nice to find all that out and, and try to reproduce it. If you want to come to the den, I'll show you the craftsman style room. And we've come now into the den, which I understand from Irene was the room most used by the family here historically. And how was this room used? Well, actually, this was two rooms, believe it or not. But um, Mr. Denny had said that the house was really hard to heat. Uh, there was a wood-burning stove in each room, so uh, the family would, would think twice before spreading themselves into too many rooms and having to let, light so many fires. So this first half here had a large um, pot-bellied stove in it, and he said that's where the family, and that would be the parents, the grandparents, and the three children would congregate every evening and discuss uh, the happenings of the day and listen to um, Mr. Denny's homemade crystal radio set. But, but um, tight quarters. <laughs> <laughs> but warm that way. <laughs> which is, I guess, why um, they did it. Um, one thing that's interesting here is the paneling is grained. And I had thought that it was done perhaps much later uh, to um, cover up many coats of paint. But Mr. Denny remembers that even in the 20s, um, it was already grained. And it's a very fine example of graining. Each um, panel of the wainscoting is a different type of uh, oak graining uh, and really well done. You have to look very hard to tell that it's uh, uh, grained. Was that something common for the arts and crafts period as well? Well, I hadn't thought so, but since Mr. Den Denny recalls it having been done that early, it shows the reason for it then was that you could take an inexpensive wood like fir and grain it to look like an expensive fir. Mm. Even the living room mantle uh, and parts of the dining room walls uh, are grained, but you really have to look twice. <laughs> so uh, uh, then the front half of this room was a, a little breakfast nook, but um, this was the most often used uh, part of the house, right off the kitchen, and uh, everyone congregating uh, around a warm stove. This is the one room which I wanted to uh, have the, the most craftsman style look, and you'll see a Morris recliner and mm. the craftsman style couch um, and another rocker there. Now, I have to say that it isn't necessarily the most comfortable furniture in the world, the straight back and the, uh, the um, hard wooden arms, but the, the, the wood always had a lovely finish to it, and you'd love to touch the wood uh, and feel that soft finish. Craftsmen took a great deal of pride in this hand-rubbed finish that they would uh, produce. And I and understand this craftsman look is coming back in oh, now, yes. so everybody's going to have uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but then the pillows that you see here are reproductions of stickly um, pillows. Uh, the designs have been reproduced, and so then people would use these overstuffed pillows to make those couches and chairs more comfortable. And then the lampshades that you see are uh, mica, and that was very popular in the uh, craftsman era too. Now was any of this furniture original to the family or, or have you purchased all of it for the room? Well in the living room you saw um, oh they kind of look like library tables and it was the Denny's dining table. Um, we couldn't use it as such because there were no leaves so we separated it into the two uh, library tables that you see and then upstairs there's a a bed that Mr. Uh, Denny had as a child. But everything you see here are antique pieces that I have collected. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for inviting us to your home, and it's been a wonderful tour, and we hope to see you next time on The History Show. Thank you. Mm -hmm.